Hello, my name is Sasheen Littlefeather. I'm Apache and I'm president of the National Native American Affirmative Image Committee. I'm representing Marlon Brando this evening and he has asked me to tell you that he very regretfully cannot accept this very generous award. And the reasons for this being are the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry. Excuse me. What's a Native American? Is it this? You got him, buddy. Maybe it goes way past John Wayne. It might be this. Come on, see it. Keep your hands to yourself. Hey, 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 hey. Keep your hands to yourself. That still doesn't seem right. Every American student has had at least some basic education about the natives. Teepees, wampum, parfletches, the Trail of Tears? But where does that education end? Here, let's test it. Where are the Native Americans right now? Good, you got it right. A reservation. Now point to me on this map of the United States where those reservations are. Are you finding it tricky? I'll make it easy for you. Tribes housed on a reservation, also called a res by its locals, include the Cherokee, the Navajo, and the Lakota. The Lakota tribe, also known as the Sioux, lives on the Pine Ridge Reservation and the Rosebud Reservation, both in South Dakota. Let's quickly go over this tribe's history. In 1868, the United States government entered Lakota lands. Instead of coming to take over the little land the Lakota had left, the government had a little treaty in mind. This treaty promised that Uncle Sam wasn't going to step foot in Lakota lands as long as the Lakota promised not to start any trouble with Uncle Sam. The Lakota agreed, and for two years, everything seemed like it was going to be okay. In 1870, gold prospectors realized that the Lakota were living on top of one of the largest gold sites in the country, and the government decided to rip up the treaty and strike it rich, initiating a war with the helpless tribe. Fighting finally ended in 1877, soon after the Lakota and other native tribes humiliated the United States after a strong win in the Battle of Little Bighorn. Despite the loss, the government ended up winning the conflict against the natives. Uncle Sam decided that he had had enough with the Lakota, who by then were one of the last tribes that hadn't quit and succumbed to the United States pressure. So Uncle Sam made this offer. Either the Lakota give up the sacred Black Hills land and take money in return, or the government would just take it anyway. Long story short, the government took it anyway, throwing the money to the Lakota and running off with its new prize. To this day, not a single native tribe has accepted the $1.3 billion that have been offered. That is where our school history textbooks end, so that must be the end, right? That is what the government of the United States of America wants you to believe. So what really happened? People forgot. My name is Fez Zuffer, and I'm a 15-year-old filmmaker from Des Moines, Iowa. In June 2017, I traveled to the Rosebud and Pine Ridge Reservations in the bottom of South Dakota to try and learn what had really happened. It is important to note the following. The Rosebud Reservation has an unemployment rate of 87%. With a population of 25,000, that means that almost 22,000 do not have a job. The poverty rate on the reservation is 48%, and teen suicide, drug and alcohol abuse, and gang violence are only some of Rosebud's many problems. The Pine Ridge Reservation, located two hours away, sees an average per capita income of around $4,000 each year and an unemployment rate of 90%. The life expectancy is the lowest of any region in the United States and the second lowest of any region in the entire Western Hemisphere, with the lowest being Haiti. 
This means that the Pine Ridge life expectancy is lower than that of every single country in North, Central, and South America. To start my journey, I arrived at the Rosebud Reservation in the town of Mission, South Dakota. While there, I came across a newly built boys and girls club for Lakota children aged 7 to 18. I had the opportunity to sit down and meet with Nicole Schiedler, the club's education director. Like if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have the bottom tier, which is like base needs, food, shelter, safety and security. And then you have to get those met before you can graduate to the next level, essentially. And then that's um, the very top is like self-actualization and fulfillment. So if you're encountering any barriers down here, you're not going to make it all the way up. Nicole emphasizes that it is the club's mission to provide these basic needs for local children, and that by providing these needs, the club is thereby reducing the number of children who fall into substance abuse or gang activity. After receiving permission, I shadowed staff as they went about their daily route around town to recruit children off of the streets to take part in the club, passing out flyers to almost a dozen children. As we continued to drive along, I noticed that public housing zones continued endlessly for miles on end, with broken windows covered with cardboard and the streets completely deserted in the blistering heat. Back at the club, I sat down with a few children who agreed to speak on camera. I had just three questions for each of these kids. First, what do you want to be when you grow up? I was thinking about going into school to become a teacher. I think I want to be a vet or a pediatrician. Uh, I wanted to um, go into geology and archaeology. I want to be a physical therapist. Oh wow, that's great. Second, do you currently practice the Lakota culture? I do, yes. Yeah, I just recently got back into it. I'm like a, I'm a royalty, I'm a native princess, like for powwows and stuff like that. It was unanimous. Every single child practices the culture in one way or another. But then I asked the third question. In 100 years, will the Lakota culture still exist? I feel like the culture will be preserved some. It's kind of hard to like say, because... Sure. I feel like our seventh generation is a very strong generation. Like, we, we do a lot to like try to learn our language and like practice and stuff. And I don't think it will ever go extinct because we were here first and we're still here. I think it's already going extinct. <clears throat> like there's less and less people who know how to speak Lakota and less and less people who go to um, traditional ceremonies. It was polarizing. Half said yes and half said no. What is the cause for so many children feeling so pessimistic about the future of their culture? It was time to go back to the drawing board. Soon after being forced onto reservations, the Lakota realized that their culture was dying. To maintain the spirituality that the Lakota had enjoyed for centuries, tribal leaders would organize congregational dances on the reservations, and the Lakota became happy again for a time. The United States government, however, feared that these congregations would enable the natives to plan a revolt against the country. The government had to do something to keep the Lakota from coming together for these dances, but what could it do? The First Amendment of the Constitution firmly states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. So the government decided to add a little asterisk to the First Amendment. All of these laws are still true, except if you are Native American. It was now illegal for Native Americans to practice their religion, culture, traditions, or anything. Those that were discovered to be practicing the culture were thrown into asylums across the United States where conditions were unlike any other place on earth. Hundreds died in these asylums, and to make an example of them, local governments chose to bury these natives in unmarked graves just outside fence cemeteries. To make sure that the culture would die with these natives, the government would wait until children became old enough to go to school, before physically removing native children from their families and taking them to boarding schools off of the reservation hundreds of miles away. 
It was at these boarding schools where children were forced to abandon their culture and assimilate to the American way. Adopting Western names, cutting their hair short, beginning to wear Western clothing, and learning how to read and speak in English instead of the Lakota language. After a few years without seeing their parents, the native children were placed into foster homes hundreds of miles away from the reservation by the government, before being adopted by white families that would help the assimilation process develop more smoothly. This cycle of kidnapping began in the 1880s, continuing throughout the first half of the 20th century, before coming to an end in just 1975, when the government finally began allowing natives to practice their culture and religion. By then, however, it was too late. For decades, hundreds of thousands of children grew up feeling confused and scared, struggling to let go of their families and culture to embrace another family and a culture that was being forced upon them. These children grew up spiraling into substance abuse and crime in an environment where no one around them encouraged them to dream, to go to school, to yearn for a better life. A lack of education for these children resulted in a lack of proper job opportunities resulting in the broken communities I saw in Rosebud and Pine Ridge. Interestingly, many are quick to assert that due to affirmative action, Native Americans have many opportunities open for them if they, quote, try harder. But here is the reality. How can children try harder if no one around them is telling them to try harder? How could they try harder for a better life if no one is telling them that a better life exists? How can the parents tell their kids to try harder if trying harder has given them nothing their entire lives? And now, after all of this has happened, the Lakota are still being punished. You know, we were only one of the tribes to successfully over, you know, overthrow the the U.S. government whenever they're trying to battle us. You know, mm -hmm. about a little big horn, trying mm -hmm. custard, all that. You know, mm -hmm. and then with that, I think that our our tribe gets the least of everything because of what we did. You know, how we stood up for our people and stuff. So you think that the Lakota tribe is still being punished? Yeah, in in a sense, yeah, because we have all these other. Um, reservations that have all this extra money coming in from the government stuff but with us they like really scarce to help us you know they will but they don't give us as nearly as much help as other tribes i think people don't realize that uh, the united states government receives more in taxes from native americans through their revenue generation in casinos than they actually supply it, it's a misconception that we get everything for free the stuff we do get for free is substandard, and the taxes we're paying outweigh the benefits that we're receiving. According to JR and Jacob, it's astounding that reservations are able to produce the gross domestic product that they do with the worthless resources that they're being given by the government. And with the government making money off of taxes from these products, the government is actually profiting off of the suffering reservations, where people on welfare are making more money than people with jobs. So who from the government is allowing this to happen? Isn't there a department or a bureau that handles reservations? Well, the answer is yes and no. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is one of nine bureaus in the Department of the Interior, responsible for overseeing health care and the welfare checks given to the natives, both of which it is failed at. But is it really the Bureau's fault? After all, its employees have sued the government four times, claiming that the Bureau is understaffed and that the Bureau's few employees are being forced to work more than they are able. So if it's not the Bureau, then who is to blame for all of this? Is it the Democrats? Is it the Republicans? The answer is everyone. Every single president from Washington to Bush to Obama to Trump is at fault for tricking the American people into thinking that all has been okay with the natives ever since 1877. But is the government the only entity to blame? The media, the sole controller of all of our news. The media decides the news we get, when we get it, how we get it, and how we will be impacted by it. Since its birth, the media has continued to pick and choose what the public does and doesn't need to know about the world around them. And this kind of picking and choosing is exactly why we all forgot about a community 
so close to home, yet so far.